Wenny, that kind of thing. There's some no apologies. There's no minutes from the meeting on the 24th of September. So time to half time. Members are being sent on time. Nobody is Today, for for uh, some members, uh, not mine, however, uh, or is the the last time they'll be at this meeting. And uh, the, there's a number of changes that are coming. Um, Mr. Humphreys and Mr. Anderson uh, will be leaving this committee. Mr. Wells has obviously been elevated, and uh, Ms. McCorley is also going to be leaving this committee. So this is their last meetings, and if, if uh, I can thank them for the contribution that they have made to the committee. Um, it's been appreciated uh, at times. I know we haven't always agreed, but we've always been able to, to uh, conduct ourselves in, in a respectful manner. So uh, I appreciate the work that uh, those members who are, are leaving this committee uh, have conducted themselves. And I uh, just want to put that on the record. Uh, if members are agreeable, those who aren't leaving, that I would write uh, officially on the committee's behalf to those members, thanking them for their contribution, uh, I will do that. Great. Okay. Uh, some matters arising. Um, obviously, for members that were here, we just had Daniel Greenberg come in and highlighted a number of guiding principles that I think were, were very useful by way of helping us scrutinise the Justice Bill. And if members are content, we'll ask the committee clerk uh, to look at those general principles, dissect the Justice Bill, and bring a report back to the committee um, that may be helpful for us to, uh, to do our scrutiny work. Um, then there is a forward work programme for October and November um, in your meeting folder. Um, due to uh, the attendance of the Chief Constable in, in London next week, um, that briefing session uh, may be scheduled a little bit later uh, in that day. Still hopes to, to come to the committee, um, but it uh, won't be at the, the very commencement of it. Um, also, there's two other briefings, the CGI on the report um, to the Committee on the Impact of Legal Aid Reforms and Departmental Officials on a Proposed Draft Consultation on the Criminal Law on Abortion on, in Cases of Lethal Fatal Abnormality and Sexual Crime, and uh, they will be uh, still kept on the schedule to, uh, for that meeting next week. Obviously, the Chief Constable is coming. There was an email circulated if there were any other issues um, to, to raise with him. You don't need to advise him in, a no in advance notice. I'm sure he'll be able to handle whatever comes his way uh, next week. But uh, if you did uh, want to do that, you can still let the uh, clerk know of those issues to raise with the Chief Constable. But that's not to preclude any member raising any issue that they, they wish to do so at that particular time. Uh, also, there's oral evidence sessions uh, to be agreed by the Committee on the Justice Bill. Um, which will be scheduled to take place from November onwards. The scheduling of other oral evidence sessions in that month will therefore be limited to urgent briefings. Uh, the Department has highlighted two possible um, oral briefings for the 5th of November, which will be confirmed as soon as uh, possible. The Department has suggested a written briefing on a further proposed consultation on changes to civil legal aid remuneration, um, but is willing to provide an oral briefing if uh, that would be uh, preferable. Um, so if members are content, um, we could take a written briefing and subject to what's in it. Obviously, then members could ask for an oral briefing if they felt that, that was necessary. Okay. Also, officials are due to provide uh, an oral update on firearms fees proposals and other firearms issues towards the end of November. Uh, given the planned oral evidence sessions on the bill, it's proposed that we would schedule this briefing for our meeting on the 3rd of December. If members are content, um, we will schedule that to take place on that date. Okay. Item 4 of the agenda is proposals to introduce statutory time limits in youth court. Um, at last week's meeting, officials briefed the committee on the results of the consultation. The Minister of Justice's proposed approach to the implementation of statutory time limits in the youth court, and they agreed to consider the information and discuss the proposals this week to establish 
uh, a committee position if that was possible. Regulations will be required to underpin the proposed uh, scheme. Um, just advise members, NIACRO has written to the committee providing a copy of the response that it submitted jointly with victim support to the department on the consultation on statutory time limits. NIACRO has outlined a number of concerns that it feels requires further exploration before any time limits are introduced and uh, which the department uh, has not yet expressed a view. That correspondence is at pages 3 to 11 of your tabled pack. So it's whether members have a particular view on this statutory time limits proposal um, for the committee to provide that opinion to the department. Obviously they can't take it forward unless the committee is going to be agreeable to it. I think there are different uh, views in the committee, are there not? In the US? There is, yeah. Uh, that being so, I mean, it's not really of any great value having a collective view, is there? Just parties or make their own views known? I suppose there was issues around the, um, that it didn't adhere to the review of Youth Justice and there were concerns raised from agencies around that and not really resolved. <coughs> Relay to the department that there's no, no consensus within the committee. Um, they can seek to engage with uh, the committee further if they wish to, or with parties individually, to see if any of the concerns that members have can be addressed. Okay, item five. In January of 2013, the committee was briefed by officials from the department, the police, and probation board on the results of a consultation on development of a strategic framework for reducing offending. Key objectives of the framework include promoting effective joined up working, providing potential offenders with different and better life choices and assisting individuals to desist from offending behaviour. The department has provided a report setting out the progress made in the first year since the framework was published. Members are content to note the progress report. If there's any other comments or information that members would wish to receive, we'll duly note it. Item 6, <coughs> the Protocol 36 of the Treaty of Lisbon uh, enabled the UK Government to decide by the 31st of May this year whether or not the UK should continue to be bound uh, by the approximately 130 police and criminal justice measures that were adopted uh, by unanimity in the Council of Ministers before the Lisbon Treaty came into force, or if it should exercise its right to opt out of them. And the UK government did exercise the opt-out and indicated its intention to seek to rejoin 35 of the measures, including the European arrest warrant. The department has provided an update on the current position and indicated that agreement to rejoin 35 measures has been agreed in principle. Uh, apart from some technical points, it's anticipated that agreement will be reached before the 1st of December this year, which will ensure there are no operational gaps. The department has identified seven of the 35 measures will require some legislative change to ensure compliance with these regulations. Uh, <coughs> Westminster intends to introduce secondary legislation designed to allow ministers to delay regulations to implement EU decisions and directives, ensuring compliance with all aspects of the measures that the UK is seeking to rejoin by the 1st of December. No date has been set for the introduction of the order, but the Department has advised that it could be uh, very close to the 1st of December deadline if members are content to note the information that has been provided, we will do so. Item 7. In May of this year, the Department provided information on the implementation of reforms that would be applied to police officers' terms and conditions following successful negotiations at the Police Negotiating Board. The effect of the reforms is to streamline terms and conditions for officers and, in the process, reduce police pay and Alliance's expenditure by approximately £16 million over the next five years. The Department has now provided an update on these uh, reforms, which were brought in by ministerial determination in line with the appropriate legislation and are being applied by the PSNI. So it's for members to note uh, this update, unless more information is needed. Noted. Okay, noted. Okay, the substantive item then for today. Um, 
is the financial position that the Department finds itself in. The relevant pages for members in your meeting folder are pages 133 uh, through to 154. Obviously, members are aware of um, the budget crisis that is impacting on the Department, and therefore I am pleased to welcome formally the Minister for Justice, uh, Mr David Ford, um, Nick Perry, the Permanent Secretary, and Glenn Capper, Deputy Director of Finance from within the Department. Uh, can I make you all very welcome? Obviously, usually Mr Capper comes to the Committee and, and can execute his duties very professionally, as he always does, and, and answers uh, members' questions very diligently. Uh, but given the circumstances that are prevailing, uh, it was my view, and the committee shared that, that it was important to hear from the minister uh, on the issues that are facing the department. Um, so uh, hopefully you appreciate that and, and understand in no way is it a slight upon Mr Capper uh, whatsoever. So I'm going to hand over to you, Mr Ford. The session will be recorded by Hansard and, and uh, published in due course. And I'm quite sure members will have questions after you've made your, your opening remarks. Thank you, Chair. If it was any slight on Glenn, it was a slight on my part, intruding on his normal performance. But thank you for the opportunity to, to brief the Committee on the current financial position. As we all know, October monitoring would normally be a relatively straightforward process, where Glenn or other officials brief you on the outcome of the Department's monitoring process and identify bids which are going forward to DFP. But as we're all aware, this year's position is very far from straightforward, and I believe the justice system, looking at the financial position this year and next, now faces a very difficult situation. The Department and the Committee have worked closely together over the past four years to deliver significant reforms. And this has produced very successful outcomes, for example, in the prison service and in delivering legal aid reform. Given our shared concern about the impact of cuts on the justice system, I thought it would be responsible and helpful to brief you frankly and in person on the financial position and to outline the impact of cuts that the Department has had to make already this year. So if you're content, I will refer to this year's position and then add a few words about 2015-16. As background, I should note that the DOJ took a 7.2% resource Dell baseline reduction across the budget 2011-15 period, a higher cut than the Northern Ireland Civil Service average. The executive agreed that the DOJ budget should be ring-fenced, recognising the risk of pressures in the justice system. Ring-fencing does not mean protection. It simply means that the DOJ received the direct Barnet consequentials of the Home Office and the Ministry of Justice spending review settlements. I have managed that risk to date and, prior to June monitoring, had plans in place to do so again this year. Obviously, that situation changed completely following the June monitoring, the outcome of which for the DOJ was as follows. First, a bid of £19.7 million for legal aid and other pressures was not funded. And second, the DOJ ring fence was effectively lifted, with 2.1 per cent cuts immediately imposed and a further 2.3 per cent of cuts to be imposed as part of October monitoring round, a total cut of £47.3 million, or 4.4 per cent. In anticipation of June monitoring, Nick Perry and I briefed the chief executives and accounting officers of all our agencies and indeed PBs and asked them to outline the impact of cuts. I and my senior team then undertook a rigorous process to examine the implications and deliverability of these cuts, <coughs> the impact on frontline operations and public safety. In deciding on the level of cuts, I have sought to protect frontline services and reduce any public safety impact as far as possible. However, given the scale of the in-year cuts, this has not always been achievable. Following this process, revised budgets were issued to all spending areas, and the briefing you received details the level of savings required. It is important to note that, to date, any DOJ bid for additional funding for legal aid has not been met, so the requirements to absorb pressures internally remains. Therefore, revised budgets take into account the need to make further cuts over and above the £47 million imposed as part of June monitoring. It would be irresponsible not to plan on that basis. Overall, based on the position following June monitoring, the departmental budget requires savings in excess of 7 per cent to be generated. The savings required from individual bodies of areas as shown within the briefing you received for the meeting. In seeking to protect frontline services as far as possible, certain spending areas, such as the core department and the policing board, are required to generate savings in excess of 10 per cent. 
Large frontline organisations such as the PS9 and the court service are being asked to deliver savings of 7% or more. Other bodies such as criminal justice inspection and the police ombudsman are required to deliver 6.4% and 6.2% respectively. A range of other bodies such as the probation board, youth justice agency and prison service are all required to deliver savings in excess of 5.5%. This is particularly challenging for the prison service as it has already endured a baseline reduction of 15% over the last four years against the backdrop of a rising prisoner population. There, as in other areas, public safety, and in particular the continuing safety of prisoners and staff, is a key concern, which is why the required savings have been kept at this level at the expense of other parts of the department. The briefing provides details of the severe impact of those cuts. I'm conscious that the Chief Constable is operationally independent and it is for him to ultimately decide where PSNI cuts will hit. He is due to brief the policing board tomorrow on the implications and I understand he will hold a media briefing after that. He is also due to meet you next week and will no doubt be in a position to provide more details. However, he has told me that the impact on the PSNI will be very significant. Savings of 7% or £51 million need to be delivered this year. That is bigger than the budget of a district, the police's largest district, and will have an immediate impact on police numbers, both police officers and staff. It will mean less overtime, which will in turn impact directly on community policing, on the PSNI's response capability and the ability to combat serious crime. And as you've seen from yesterday's announcement, it will also lead to the cessation of HET in its current form, as well as the return to desk jobs of many officers who have been moved out of those jobs and into frontline policing duties. It will impact, I imagine, on the police estate and on the PSNI's ability to fund partner organisations doing valuable work in the community. These direct impacts do not only relate to policing. The wider justice system will also be significantly affected. Cuts of, ne of nearly £6 million, 5.6%, will have an immediate impact on the operational prison regime, with prisoners spending longer in cells, and a reduction in grants to the voluntary and community sector and visitor services. Some of these bring risks. You will also be aware of the significant reforms made across the prison service since the devolution of justice, which is indeed a PFG commitment. And as I advised previously, the prison's baseline has already reduced by 15% over the past four years. Cuts at the levels proposed may jeopardise the stability of these reforms. There will be a direct impact on the ability of the court service to discharge its statutory functions in administering courts and tribunals as they face cuts of 7.6%. A very visible frontline impact will be that courthouses will need to close. Indeed, the old town hall courthouse in Belfast will temporarily close from the beginning of November. I plan to begin a process of public consultation on the closure of other courthouses in the event that further budget cuts are required next year. It may even be necessary to move faster than that and close other courthouses on a temporary basis. Any further reduction in the number of essential frontline court service staff will inevitably have an adverse impact on access to justice for citizens. The Probation Board faces cuts of 5.6%, which represents £1 million of funding, so there will be a reduction in the number of probation officers and an immediate impact on the ability to monitor offenders when caseload is increasing. This highlights further the point I referred to above that it is no longer possible to fully protect all frontline areas and this brings with it an increase in the risk to public safety. In the absence of an agreed position on the past, the pressures facing the justice system in relation to legacy issues continue to increase. As I have said, cuts will impact significantly on the work of legacy activity in the PSNI and impact the police ombudsman's historic investigations. The Chief Constable will no doubt brief you further on these matters in due course. There will also be an immediate impact on the progress of a number of high-profile inquests into deaths dating back to the Troubles. In terms of legal aid, you will know that this expenditure is demand-led, and with the Committee's support, I have already delivered significant reforms. However, the baseline funding does not cover the level of expenditure required. If no further funding is made available in-year, there will be no option but to restrict legal aid payments during the year, which will increase the pressure next year. I am grateful for the very positive approach that the Committee took to progressing the Legal Aid and Coroner's Court Bill, which went through further consideration stage yesterday. The Department will continue to need your support as you consider proposals on financial eligibility, further reform of Crown Court fees and options to the reform of the scope of civil legal aid. I have looked particularly carefully at the core Department 
My priority, as I've said, being to protect the front line. The Department is therefore facing cuts as high as 16 per cent in some areas, much higher than any of our arms length bodies. In addition to the suppression of posts and other measures, in effect all discretionary spend has now been suspended. These are just some examples of the impact of in-year cuts. Obviously each area is still working through the details, but I think this analysis begins to illustrate how widely and critically the justice system will be affected. The next steps in-year are unclear. You'll be aware that the Finance Minister sought to table a paper to the Executive last week dealing with the need for further cuts. However, as part of the October monitoring round, my Department will resubmit its £20 million legal aid bid that was unfunded in the June monitoring round and will also seek additional funding to offset as much as possible the impact of in-year cuts. I should add that the cuts I have outlined this afternoon are based on the June monitoring figure of 4.4 per cent savings. At last week's unsatisfactory executive discussion on the budget, figures of 6 per cent and higher were mentioned. I have to make it absolutely clear that further cuts to the justice budget without extra funding being provided would immediately worsen the frontline impact and in many cases would simply not be deliverable at this point halfway through the financial year. When there is more certainty about the outcome of October monitoring or the in-year position more generally, my department will of course keep you updated. If I may, Chair, then I'd like to say a brief word about 2015-16. If there are uncertainties around this year's financial position, next year's picture is even more unclear. That in turn impacts on the decisions we take this year, where those decisions would make a financial commitment in future years. Having received information on the level of potential cuts, Nick has written to all of our bodies <coughs> asking them to assess the impact of cuts of 10% and 15% against the opening baselines for 2014-15. Cuts could be higher but well, that is the level we've been asked to model at this stage. Therefore, there is little doubt that, unfortunately, very difficult funding and prioritisation decisions will be required soon. They will have a major impact on the wider justice system and on the services we provide. Although there is not yet an agreed timetable for the 2015-16 budget setting process, the Department will continue to engage with DFP and will advise you as soon as possible of the next steps. We're happy, of course, to take any questions that members have. Okay, Minister. Um, you've outlined a very bleak picture in terms of what you're having to deal with. In terms of the scale of the carnage that this is going to wreak within your department, on a 1 to 10, how, how much carnage is going to be caused? <coughs> I would be tempted to say something like 8 or 9, except for the reality that next year's carnage on that basis will be scoring off the scale of 1 to 10. It is an extremely difficult position, exacerbated by the fact that these changes were introduced when we had plans to deal with our budget as we believed had been set for the four-year period, and that was then changed in the June monitoring <coughs> round. So that having taken significantly bigger hits than the Northern Ireland block for three and a half years, we then got, as a department, the biggest hit of all in the June monitoring round. Uh, from your own point of view uh, as Minister, are you prepared to preside over the level of cuts th that need to be implemented by your department? Well, I have made the point that the executive as a whole needs to be realistic about prioritisation across departments, that what went on in June was basically an unsustainable position to protect two departments without taking any account of the pressing needs across uh, priorities, frankly, potentially in any department, rather than assuming that only two departments had priorities. Uh, I trust that what we now have an understanding of an executive uh, detailed discussion uh, in the near future will give the opportunity to look at those kind of issues. But certainly I believe I have a responsibility to highlight the impact which is currently there. Uh, the challenge is whether the executive can collectively uh, recognise those realities and deal with them. You're not resigning over this? If that's an invitation to suggest that the Department of Justice and its agencies will be in any better position with somebody else sitting at my desk, I don't see that as being the current position. But if I believe that my position is no longer assisting the welfare of the people of Northern Ireland, I will not be putting up with this. Okay. I want to get into to some of the, the detailed figures that you have provided to us. Um, the 47 million. Um, is based on 
the June monitoring round, is that correct? And not on the most recent paper that the EFP has circulated? This is the point where I, you probably should be looking at Glyn, not at me, for the detail. But my, uh, I mean, the position was that we were in an unsatisfactory position in the June monitoring round, gave us specific arrangements for 2.1 per cent cuts, but also then referred to 2.3 per cent cuts coming in October. Mm -hmm. We have sought to plan on that basis, <coughs> and that's the 4.4 per cent, which has produced 47 million. But your understanding, Minister, is it may well go up to 6 per cent. That is the sort of figure which is currently being hinted at as a possibility on the basis of other figures which, you know, which have emerged since June monitoring. And what's that in real cash terms? If, if you had 47 million, what, what, what could it be? Uh, another I'm glad you're looking at Glenn at this point. Uh, another 1.6 would equate to 17, an additional £17 million. Pounds. Okay. And that hasn't been factored in in the presentation that you've gave today in terms of the impact of what the cuts could be. No. So you you, no. you would have another £17 million pounds of cuts on top of the... That is, that is the potential, but of course, I mean, as I said, we would also be seeking to bid in the October <coughs> monitoring round for some of the pressures relating to, uh, to legal aid and to policing. And part of the difficulty is... <coughs> We're trying to forecast how that might impact against any, any further percentage cut across the block generally. You mentioned public safety a number of times and that this will lead to an increased risk. Can you describe exactly what you mean by way of public safety potentially being compromised? Well, it is certainly clear that uh, the police service has had to... Uh, terminate the contracts of a number of civilian employees with the result that there will be backfilling of some of those posts by police officers. There will therefore be fewer police officers available on the streets. There were a number of probation officers who were on short-term contracts. Uh, those contracts have been terminated, so there are already fewer probation officers. The expectation is that further cuts to prisons will see a reduction in the work done, done by some of our voluntary sector partners as well as increased lockups for prisoners. Both of those are likely to impact on safety both within prisons and when prisoners are released in terms of likelihood of reoffending. So those are three you know, key specific areas <coughs> where there is a likelihood of an increase uh, in the danger to public safety because of the, uh, the lack of those who have been carrying out that good work or the number of hours that they can work. On, on the probation board side of things, uh, You've touched upon the ability to monitor offenders could be compromised. Well, what type of offenders are you talking about that the probation board may not be able to effectively monitor? Well, that, that comes down to you know, the operational issues as to how probation choose to manage, how far they, you know, they see they can increase individual officers' caseloads. But I mean, clearly there are a range of offenders who are subject to probation supervision some of whom are at the relatively modest end of things, others of whom are quite serious offenders who have served part of, their, you know, part of their sentence in custody and are then out in the community. And obviously there are also um, cases like those who are sex offenders who may be under grave supervision, which is more intense than others. Uh, I would presume the probation service uh, would seek to maintain uh, their supervision of the more serious offenders, potentially uh, meaning that they inevitably have to, have to reduce the level of supervision. For example, one point that was highlighted to me was a cutback in the number of home visits and people only being seen in the office. And if probation officers only see people in the office, they do not get the full picture of them. Mm -hmm. So their assessments of dangerousness or liability to reoffend are more difficult because they're not getting the full rounded picture that they would see when they have the time to do home visits. And in terms of the prison service, um and we know that the staffing complement is already below what it should be in both McGalbury and Hyde Bank. Um, and my understanding was that there would need to be recruitment uh, taking place. Will that be happening in terms of recruiting staff into the prison service to deal with the pressures that already exist? I can't uh, give you an absolute figure on that. I haven't seen anything specific from uh, Sue McAllister on terms of the recruitment unless Nick has something on it, but certainly I would think it would be very difficult to look at any significant recruitment programme on the scale of the further cuts that they're being asked to make. Mm -hmm. 
I don't, I don't believe prisons have <coughs> any um, recruitment plan, plans at the moment. But if I'm wrong, we will inform the committee. Mm. Because certainly the the attrition rate of new recruits is is concerning, and given the what's required in the establishments and they're currently understaffed, uh, it seems to me that recruitment needs to take place, and certainly that's the message I've been getting when I've been in those institutions uh, to deal with the pressures that staff face. So my understanding was that there would need to be recruitment, um, and obviously with the budget problems that you're facing, uh, that may well not be uh, taking place. I think in that sense, recruitment right across the justice system is in a very similar position, including the fact that we, you know, uh, we had an agreed number for police officers uh, as part of a very intensive exercise last year, which it may well be over the next year or two we're unable to maintain. Um, in terms of the legal aid payments, can you outline to me exactly how you will be able to stop those payments? Is, is work going to be carried out by the professions, but just not paid for? No. It's Given that we have a legal obligation to make payments, you can be assured and uh, lawyers can be assured that they will be paid. The reality is we may simply be in the position that we run out of money towards the end of this financial year, which would mean that a bill that might otherwise have been paid in January or early February might not be paid until April. Second, which would mean bills will be paid, but if there is no money in the account, they can't be paid within the financial year until further money is added to it by the Treasury. In terms of the police budget, um, Minister Hamilton had highlighted to the Finance and Personnel Committee the need for them to open up the books better. Um, can you tell me just the relationship that the police have with your department by way of opening up the books so that you have a very clear understanding of <coughs> the, the financial issues that they are facing? Well, I'm going to ask Glenn to go through the details of that because there are complexities between the role of the department, the role of the policing board, and the role of the police themselves, uh, because many of these issues are operational issues. But we have been getting a fairly good <coughs> set of information as to how things are currently working within the police. Yeah, I, I actually met uh, with <coughs> AFP officials last week on, on, on this issue and others. Um, in terms of direct engagement, the AFP's direct engagement is with um, the department um, and the finance team in the department, who then um, uh, coordinate discussions and so on with police finance colleagues. Um, we have received requests for information from the AFP on police. Um, we've provided um, information uh, to DFP and I actually arranged last week um, that there would be a further set of information going to DFP officials in the next few weeks so the, the information flow is there um, and, and we are uh, meeting DFP's requirements on on the level of information they expect to see and want to see on the police budget okay the 20 approximately 27 million pounds that the police are getting for security related issues from Treasury is that entirely ring-fenced for those issues, or is there any latitude for that to be used? No, it, it is entirely ring-fenced and specific for those issues, and indeed the Finance Minister's uh, June monitoring paper made it clear that any cuts could not impact on that area of work. Okay. Um, your department, unlike any other, has this end-year flexibility um, process to carry money over. How much has been accumulated by the department? Do you have access to, to that stock? Uh, the, the only amount at the minute that the department has access to um, is a total of £15 million, um, and that's specific to police. Um, only police can draw down and access that funding, um, and police have factored that into their plans for this year. Okay. So in addition to the police budget you see in your, your papers, um, they will be drawing down £15 million from Treasury. Um, and that, that finishes the access to, to EYF over the budget period. Okay, so none of that will be lost to Treasury? That will be? No. Okay. Um, just briefly then, and I will bring other members in. In terms of the next financial year, what are the types of decisions that you really need to be taking at this point to be preparing for that year? I think one of the key issues which simply hasn't been addressed by the executive yet is around the potential for a redundancy scheme for civil servants. I mean, they said that in the context that we have known for a lengthy period of time 
of those who were losing their jobs uh, in Coleraine and DBA. Uh, and yet, even faced with that, no redundancy scheme has been set up. Um, I certainly know there are senior civil servants, uh, this doesn't include either the gentleman sitting beside me, who believe that there would be a significant demand for a voluntary scheme were it to be announced. And I think that is one area where changes could be made. Though the reality is within the, you know, within the Department of Justice, so few of our staff <coughs> are, would be directly affected as a civil service scheme. We, you know, we do, frankly, need early information. We need to have some opportunity to plan in a rational way. And we should have been well into the budget setting process for next year in the month of September. So we would have some idea of, of how we make plans. At this stage, we have no, no sign of anything. It looks highly likely that it will not be possible to do the proper process with the proper consultation before the end of March. And that makes it increasingly difficult to plan. But we also will need to recognise that these cuts will impact significantly. Four years ago, we started on into this uh, CSR period with significant uh, efforts to trim down the core of the department and to protect the front line whoever it was who delivered the front line, and that included some of the voluntary sector partners whose grant aid remained at a fairly high level because they were providing direct front line services. We've now reached the point that it is simply not possible to do that level of protection. We are now in the position that everywhere is having to take some fairly significant cuts. You'll see from the percentages that I outlined that we have still managed a degree of protection of a number of bodies because of the work they do but everybody is going to have to take significant cuts next year. And finally, on some of those legacy-related issues, um, what assessment have you made of the duties that uh, you have as the state to be investigating um, those historical crimes that were committed, as opposed to um, dealing with the present issues that we're facing? Um, are you not potentially leaving yourself open to challenge that you're, you're failing to carry out those duties? Well, I'm not sure whether you're putting words like yourself in the singular sense, Chair. Um, I'm not sure I am the state. I believe we collectively are the state and we have responsibilities. I also believe that I have responsibilities under Article 2 to keep society safe this year. And actually the responsibilities of the past lie more with those who had responsibility, principally the British government. I noted two interviews on Radio Ulster this morning from people who agreed with the view that I've just expressed, that there are real issues of the legacy of the past which cannot be dealt with unless there is a direct involvement by the Northern Ireland Office or other aspects of the British government funded by the Treasury, because the DOJ is funded for the present and not to deal with the past. And we simply cannot get into the position where the good work being done by justice agencies for the present cannot be carried through because of the legacy of the past. That requires a political joining up. It requires an input from the British government. It requires the Treasury to accept that there are specific issues there. But I think most people would accept that it is not possible for us to manage today's budget to deal with the past as well as with the present. And you alluded to this in question time. Obviously, the, the Chief Constable with temporary staff um, has taken a decision in respect of that, and that's going to impact on HET. Um, but there are full-time permanent police officers that are actively involved in investigating legacy issues. And the example cited in the chamber was, for example, Bloody Sunday, where there are upwards of 30 officers involved in that. Are those officers going to be taken off that to be able to protect the public today from crime? Well, I think you really will have to ask the Chief Constable that because that really is getting into operational issues. But my understanding is that we're likely to see slimming down of legacy work and bringing together of some of that legacy work into a single unit uh, because of the concerns of today as well as of yesterday. But I've probably now gone further than I should have and I'm not going any further than that. If, you, if you're seeing him next week, he will be in a position to answer that question. Yeah. Um, um. You may well have already have the information publicly, but we will simply <coughs> ask those type of questions. So um, thank you for, for that. Mr McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I mean, and obviously there's a lot of detail in this, and I'm sure some of it we will revisit in time. In terms of, and when you were reading out at the beginning in your presentation, there was about three or four different bands of, 
of areas of cuts. Uh, can I ask how, how that was decided, what, what the area of cuts should be for particular agencies? It was, I mean, allowing for what I've said earlier about the, the need for the executive to look at priorities across all departments as opposed to having to do it internally, but all we could do at this stage was internally seek to see where the biggest pressures were, where the biggest issues of public safety were, and to protect that front line as far as possible. Um, I mean, it's why, for example, Sijini and uh, the police ombudsman have a smaller level of cuts. Uh, it's why when, when areas of the core department are having very significant cuts, even allowing for that they've taken the biggest cuts up to now, that we've done that to prioritise you know, as best we could. But the, the reality is these cuts are of such a scale so late in the year that it's not possible to, you know, to do what we would want to do. And, and in terms of the final sign-off on this, who, who has the ultimate responsibility for the sign-off? You mean of what we're saying here now? Yeah, yeah of, of this presentation. Who, who's going to take a decision that these are the, 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 the final decision of the Department of Justice as we go forward? I think the, the correct answer to that is probably a combination of the Minister and the Accounting Officer. Yeah, because between us we have to take those decisions and justify them. Okay, and in the, the round of discussion with the agencies, was there a, a, an impact assessment carried out? Does that, the, the impact that these cuts would have on the particular organisations? I'm not sure if that's the right term, but Glyn was most responsible for the detail. If, if I <coughs> the process, that will hopefully answer your question. Um, as the Minister said, he and Nick met with the Chief Executives and Accounting Officers of, of all of our arms length bodies and agencies. Um, arms length <coughs> bodies were invited to describe uh, and outline the impact of cuts against a number of categories, including um, at one extreme the impact on the back office up to the impact on the front line and public safety. Um, so we gathered information from all of our bodies on that scale um, and that then fed into the decision-making process. And it's been <coughs> reinforced of course, by meetings. The, the Ministers met um, the Chief Constable, the Policing Board, the Lord Chief Justice, the Police Ombudsman, a whole range of uh, the, the um, Chair of the Probation Board to discuss the, the cuts and their implications. So all of that's been taken into account in, in arriving at these figures. As, as the Minister said, we've done our best to protect the front line where we can. And as a result of, of those meetings, was any of the percentages either increased or decreased? There been some adjustments as a result of those discussions. And was part of the impact assessment in terms of public confidence in the, the, the justice system and the, the wider policing structures? Was that part of your assessment? The assessment asked for, as I said, information on the public safety impact, on the frontline impact, and that collectively, through the information provided and through the engagement with the bodies, um, in, informed the decision that took those, those sorts of things into account. And the, uh, in all the meetings, I think the issue of public confidence in the institutions, um, including the accountability arrangements, um, came, came up quite forcibly. And <coughs> the judgment is about the impact on public confidence in that sense versus the impact on public confidence of not being able to deliver critical services today. No, but, but I'm, I'm asking the specific question, you know, what weight was put on public confidence as much as public safety? I'm not sure that you can actually separate them out in that context, because public safety today is a very significant part of public confidence, yeah. clearly for those most affected by the past. You know, then there are issues relating to how we handle the, those legacy issues, which <coughs> also impact on their confidence. But it's not that there's, you know, it's an either or. They, I think they, you, they run alongside each other. But that wasn't clear in the answers. <clears throat> the, 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 perhaps that should have been the answer rather than, you know, as if they are two separate entities. I think so. Well, when I asked the question about, uh, I wasn't told, no, that, that was a priority and public safety and public confidence are, are both one and the same, which you have said, so there, there seems to be a difference of opinion here about the weight put on public confidence. I don't think there's any difference in what we've said. You, you don't think there's a difference? No. Right, fine. That's, uh, uh, perhaps I pick it up wrong, but I, I, I certainly didn't see any attempt by anyone to say that public confidence was high on our priority when we were uh, implementing these cuts. That, that, that's, that's what I picked up. Public safety was the bigger concern until you said we were both one and the same thing. Well, I didn't quite say the one and the same thing, but I said that you know, safety has a significant impact on confidence today. 
and there are other people for whom the, the issue of competence is more related to their personal circumstances. Okay. Well, the reason why I asked that is, is that in terms of the Ombudsman, uh, the cut on the Ombudsman's office, uh, it, it seems to be very high uh, in proportion to his budget. Uh, in terms of the commentary in the last 24 hours, is there anything you have heard in the last 24 hours that change your mind in terms of the weight given in public confidence in relation to the work of the Ombudsman's office? Well, Glenn will keep you right, but I believe that the Ombudsman's office was one of very few spending areas within the justice system which actually <coughs> has received an increase over the last four years, and they've actually taken a lower cut in this particular exercise. So I think that's a fair degree of protection that if you... Is he right? Yeah, that, that's correct. The Ombudsman's Office was the only area um, that received between 2010 and 2014 a, a budget increase. Yeah, right. So they received a budget increase and then they received a smaller cut. That sounds to me like protection. Right. I, I'm not going to get into the statistics of this, but they have a budget of £7 million and they're loss in 750000 Michael McGuire has said publicly that will have a massive impact on both the historical work and the current work. Uh, I, I'm asking you, have you heard anything in the last 24 hours that would change your mind that this is going to have a massive impact in public confidence in the office of the police ombudsman in a week that the criminal justice inspector has said the confidence has been restored because we had for a number of years where it was, for whatever set of words you want to use, but certainly confidence wasn't high. Is there anything you've heard in the last 24 hours in relation to families and their expectations being lowered by this decision to take £750,000 out of their budget, given that there's other agencies within the Justice Department have higher budgets and could mop up £750,000? Well, sorry, I don't, I don't recognise the figures of, of £750,000 out of £7 million. I think you must be taking account of what we had hoped to, to give them a further increase until the June monitoring was imposed on us. It's not, it's not actually that scale. I mean, the, the, current, the complete decrease is... Yeah, it was about £564,000 come yeah, out, which yeah, was 6.2%. Yeah. But, but in real terms, in terms of the Ombudsman laying out his programme of work to ensure the trajectory, the confidence would be stored in the office, he believed that it's cut to £750,000. But the reality is the trajectory of all kinds of other spending areas has also been trimmed back and trimmed back much higher. Yeah. than we've done to the Ombudsman. But in terms office. of public confidence, and that's the point I'm making, because if, if you're trying to, to, to keep the trajectory going around public confidence and say, the police service, do you not think that when, when this type of decision plays itself out, that there will be an impact on the confidence of the police service as a result of this decision? There may Given be. that they're going to, he's also said, can't deal with current day complaints, <coughs> therefore the, the statutory obligation of all complaints made by the, uh, about the PSNA will not be carried out by the Ombudsman. They'll have to be carried out by the PSNA, which is wrong in the first instance, but actually will cost more money than if they were in the, the office of the Ombudsman. Well, you've put together a lot of things which I, I don't necessarily agree with, Owen, but I agree but, that well, there well, may, uh, be, well, an, there you, may uh, be an impact yeah, on the issue of If you of don't agree with anything, yeah. then you can tell me what you don't agree with, and perhaps we can have a discussion about that. Well, there may be an, an impact on the issue of confidence. Yeah. There may well also be an impact of confidence in terms of public safety being provided by the cuts to the police, to probation, to youth justice, to prisons. Those are all the harsh realities that we currently face. And I believe that we have protected the police ombudsman's office to a significantly greater level than other areas of spending have been protected. I know there'll be negative impacts everywhere we have had to make cuts. That's the, the world we live in because of the failure of the executive. And that's for a wider discussion. We have to deal with the here now of the impact on the police ombudsman's office. Well, sorry, you have described no, this. You have described we, have to, we have to deal with the impact on everything which we've talked about today. Absolutely, but at, at present I'm dealing with this, and that's, that's my prerogative. There are issues, and we can deal with them in time, and I have no issue with that. But you have said this uh, on a scale of 1 to 8 will wreak carnage in your department. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, what... what as your written of the carnage will be put on the Ombudsman's office? Well, if you're talking about a, you know, eight on a scale of one to ten because of the cuts being imposed across the department generally, then the cuts being imposed on the Ombudsman's office are <coughs> somewhat less than that. So they might score a five or six. But, you, but, now, you're, but you're accepting you're raking carnage on the Ombudsman's office with yeah. these cuts? 
I am accepting that the budget that the Department of Justice has been given is wreaking carnage on the justice system totality, not just one particular office. No, but, but you're responsible, and, and, and that's why I asked the question. Ultimately, you, you have accepted that as Minister and the Permanent Secretary, as the County yeah. Minister, are responsible. So in this instance, in this particular issue, and we've all heard the comedy in the last 24 hours around this, there's an expectation from the public that this office should not be attacked in the way it is to ensure there's maximum public confidence in our prison structures. There is that has been undermined. There is an expectation from members of the public that no aspect of the justice system should be undermined. There is an expectation from members of the public that we should continue to fund every aspect of justice. Yeah. And, and, and I have no issue with that, but we have to deal with this because, in my opinion... Yeah, but sorry, you, you are dealing with this. I am trying to deal with the overall issue, which is yeah. where I repeat the yeah. point yeah. that the Ombudsman's Office has been protected in a way that other spending areas have not been protected, having had benefits over the preceding three years which other spending areas <coughs> hadn't had. I believe in that sense I have done as much as I can do to protect you certainly that spending. You certainly haven't convinced Michael Maguire, that's the position. I wouldn't expect to convince Michael Maguire any more than I would expect to convince Sue McAllister when cuts are made to the no, prison service. But, but Michael Maguire, in fairness to him, has made this a public issue. The rest of them haven't. So they may have their own reasons because... Well, sorry, uh, I'm not doing things on the basis of who shouts loudest. I'm doing no, the basis no, of the best decisions we can take within the department. Nor am I asking you to make decisions. Well, sorry, you were close to it. Well, uh, you, you may have thought that the case, but what I'm saying is sometimes when a person <coughs> takes a public stand, mm -hmm. then perhaps they do it with good reason. And you shouldn't just think that they're shouting loud. They make the most noise. They might be doing it because they believe it's holy and absolutely right to do that. And other, other people may re remain silent for their own particular reasons. I'll not assume why. I don't think you should assume that. Michael, Michael. And other people have made the same robust case as Michael's yeah. made, with but, but evidence the public aspect of, and put to me. The, the public aspect of it, in my opinion, is because of the, the wrangle we've had in the Ombudsman's office over a number of years. My position to you today is that you are dealing... In my opinion, you're sucking the life out of an important office that will have a wider implication across the whole justice issues, not just in relation to the work of the office. And that's why I'm making the case today. That, that's, that's where the public's mind is at present on this issue, and I think you should be mindful of it. In my opinion, and Glenn has actually lowered the amount of money, it's £560,000. I think with that £550,000, you create the circumstances where you don't have this office undermined Considering Article 2 considerations, you're not here today because it's an operational matter, but given the cutbacks in the HET and indeed the collapse of the HET, then I think there's massive Article 2 considerations which will have a wider impact on public confidence on the whole structures of policing and justice in the North. And I repeat that having had the position that the Ombudsman's Office was the only spending area that received increases over the first three years, and having protected it better than other spending areas have been protected, I believe that I have done the best against all the other competing issues that the Department of Justice has to deal with. OK. I, I'm, I'm very conscious of time, Chair, but can I ask this question? Because in, in your conversation, you mentioned the, the, the responsibility of, of the British government in dealing with legacy issues. Has the Department made any representations in respect of that? You know, a similar arrangement? Um, I, I don't want to go into the financial aspects of, it, say, of the hearing, hearing aid, the hearing loss no. uh, situation. Have you made any representations in respect to that? Um, depends how you define representations. Uh, I have certainly, in some of the discussions which I had with the Secretary of State last year around the period when Richard Haas was leading the talk, <coughs> and more recently made the point that there are issues of the past which I believe are the responsibility of the British government to deal with. And, and when you say deal with, are you talking about in terms of... of the, the, the funding stream as well? Yes, I think that we, we have to reach agreement on what an HIU or whatever we might call a new institution might be. But I believe in those circumstances there is a strong moral and practical obligation on the British government to fund. And just this final point, and I think the Chair made this point, in terms of the, of the, the agencies of the, the Department, is there room and space for the books to be open to have a more rigorous examination of, of their spending streams so as when you are faced with these difficult decisions that you can satisfy yourself in the department that perhaps some of the budget lines that are being spent by some of these agencies are wholly necessary in terms of the wider 
issues around uh, policing and justice. Well, again, we need to be careful, given the, the independence <laughs> of a number of the agencies we're talking about, uh, that the department doesn't seem to be interfering. But I believe that's what Glyn and his team have been doing over recent time, you know, steering a careful line between proper financial management and not interfering with operational decisions. OK, thank you. Sorry. Just before I'm going to bring in Mr Dixon next. I wanted to get a bit more clarity on uh, if you're able to advise us on the legacy issues um, and this unit that's going to be set up by the police. Uh, there is some concern about uh, the hierarchy of victims, as people refer to it. Or do you know what the priority will be for this new unit? I, I really don't. I'm afraid you will have to ask the Chief Constable. Because there, only got a week to wait. There is the concern that investigations will focus on state actors rather than investigations, for example, for those who suffered in Le Mans. Uh, and obviously that goes to the heart of the debate that goes on to do with the past. And I think people will want to know, uh, in order to have confidence in the police, who will determine the priorities of their investigations into what happened in our past? Is that a, a concern that you have as Justice Minister? Well, it's not for me to, to suggest to the Chief Constable you know, in what way uh, he should organise that kind of work. I mean, clearly there will be prioritisation, as indeed there was prioritisation within the HET, there's prioritisation within the Ombudsman's Office, but uh, it's for you to check out with him what the, you know, what the planned prioritisation will be. Okay. Mr Dixon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Um, very difficult and uh, challenging decisions to be taken. Um, certainly, I think, for the vast majority of people, uh, public safety would have to be the number one issue in considering the, the, the totality of the, the, the justice budget. And I'm quite sure, as Mr McCartney has robustly questioned the budget of the Ombudsman, there would be many of us sitting around this table having an equally robust discussion were, for example, the probation service to fail with regards to sex offenders or the police in relation to the number of speed checks which could re re lead to a, 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 a number, additional number of load deaths. Every single thing uh, that, that you're doing impacts upon the safety of every citizen in Northern Ireland. So certainly there, there, there has to be recognition that no one part takes precedence over the other and that each decision has an, has a, a, an interlocking uh, effect on, on the totality of the delivery of, of, of um, uh, justice. Can I come turn to one point that was raised yesterday and heard in the media? And I think it might be helpful if you could um, cl clarify for us exactly what the situation is. A substantial sum of money has been set aside. Um, I'm sure Mr Capper can tell us what it is uh, for the provision of the Desert Crete facility. Can some, all <coughs> or any of that money be used to alleviate the current budget crisis if, for example, the Desert Crete project was not to proceed or continues to uh, not be delivered at this point in time? Well, so before Lynn does the capital stuff, um, I mean, I think the point you make about the, you know, the interdependency on different areas is significant, but I would make the point that this is not just something for one department. Mm. I mean, I, I find it slightly bizarre that in June we decided to protect health because they saved lives, and there was no account taken of the fact that justice also saves lives <laughs> in the way that has just been highlighted. Um, the Desert Creek uh, Programme Board is continuing its work looking through, you know, the, the current uh, state of tenders, as I understand it, I haven't had an update, which I believe I'm due to get within a few weeks. Uh, but there are technical issues about swapping capital for resource expenditure, which are way beyond me. So I will leave Glenn to take you through that. Yeah, well, I suppose the, the straightforward answer to your question is uh, no, it can't, because the Desert Creek funding is capital funding for construction projects and so on. Um, what we're talking about here is, is resource funding or running costs and so on, so the, the, the two can't be swapped. I, I understand, or at least I, I think I understand what you're saying in relation to that, but you can, under, you can equally understand why many members of the general public may not see that, and I think it bears spelling out very clearly why that answer is no. And is there anything else you can do by way of assisting us in respect of that? So there's absolutely no doubt and no ambiguity <coughs> around the fact that the answer is no. Uh, 
public finances operate under quite a, a strict set of rules, and those rules um, spell out that funding from Treasury comes in largely two tranches. One is capital, one is resource, um, and you can't move from capital to resource. That's simply the, the rule book that we operate under. And the money which may not be expended, what will happen to that? Uh, the Desert Crete funding that hasn't been spent to date over the budget period um, has gathered up into an end-year flexibility pot, um, and when access to that pot is required, um, the Department through uh, the Department of Finance and Personnel would approach Treasury. Um, there will be a discussion as we enter the 2015-16 year uh, about access to that pot, because the existing ag agreement and arrangement lasted up until March 2015. And is that part only available to, to the Department of Justice or is it available to the whole of the Department of Finance the across pot, all departments? The, the pot has been gathered up from Desert Creek under spends and is earmarked for Desert Creek. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you, Chair. Mr. McGill. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, if, if I picked up the Minister correctly earlier on there, we heard something very fundamental and quite shocking. And I would just put this to the Minister. Um, was he at the point whenever he discerned and made a distinction between the responsibilities of his department towards the present and that towards the past? Was that the department washing its hand of historic issues and a duty both political and moral to deal with those? Set particularly in the context of cuts to the HET, uh, that, uh, and I was listening carefully to the words that you used there, Minister. Um, ACC Alistair Finlay said it effectively meant the closure of the HET. You said the end of the HET in its current form. And also then the, um, the Ombudsman referred to it as having, um, on the, the issue of dealing with the past and history cases has referred to that um, and he said that they include some of the most difficult areas of our troubled past from all sections of the community that that could have impact there. Um, could you clarify please for us Minister what you were trying to say earlier? I, I you heard it quite different to what but please continue. Well, I suppose it goes down uh, to the point that the, the chair asked when he suggested I was the state. I mean, the state has certain responsibilities for dealing with the past. The state is divided into a number of different areas. I actually believe that on some of these issues of the past, the moral responsibility lies more with the department that had responsibility for justice issues at a time when these concerns arose, the Northern Ireland Office. I believe that in practical terms, the Department of Justice is funded for the needs of today and is having great difficulty as the only body which is doing any work about the past. And that is the reality. The past, which is a political priority, which is an issue uh, principally for the Northern Ireland Office, in my opinion, is being dealt with by coroner's inquests, by the police ombudsman and by the HET. And that is simply an unsustainable position at a time of significant budget cuts. I'm not washing my hands on the responsibilities that I have, but I also have responsibilities for today in a way that I was not responsible for uh, events at the time when the issues currently being investigated by, by those legacy inquiries happened. And I think there's a fundamental need to get agreements on new structures and better ways of dealing with them. And there is then an obligation on the Treasury to produce the money and not expect the current budget to deal with the problems of today, to deal with those issues of the past, which are clearly a rather bigger issue. So, just to get it clear, and um, uh, thanks for some degree of clarity around that, um, you aren't absolving the Department of Responsibility because you mentioned justice issues in the present. Many of those justice issues in the present today are legacy issues from the past that many people have to live with and are trying to seek truth and justice for. So, uh, I was very concerned to hear that you were drawing a distinction, mm -hmm. and if you like, a lane in the sand, be it moral or political, between a duty. And I accept some of that duty lies with the British government. I accept <coughs> that. Uh, but I was very concerned to hear that, Minister. Government. 
very concerned. But the reality is we have spent three and a half years with the, uh, uh, with living in this budget period, seeking to manage the needs of the past from a budget which is to deal with the present. As those cuts impact, and we have obligations to keep people safe today, it has a significant impact. And this ties across to issues like the failure of the Haas talks, like the, uh, the inability to get agreement about a better way of dealing with matters. And I believe that you, the issues of the responsibility of others come into play. The justice system cannot be left to be the only body which is actually dealing with the past. And yet that is the practical reality of where we are. So in terms of then uh, the upcoming talks, has your department prepared a paper on this issue specifically about funding and that elements of funding uh, which lay, as you would see, or your department sees immediately with the British government? Have you worked up funding proposals for <coughs> that as to what cost may be required to continue with that crucially important work to achieve truth and justice for, for victims? No, I don't, be I don't believe that we could produce a funding paper at this stage without <coughs> knowing what the shape of any possible future institution might be. Well, what work have you done on? Because since obviously you've thought through what you were, the concept that you were raising here, what work has been done by the department in anticipation of these talks where you, you clearly stated that the responsibility of your department was the here and now, or the present, and the past potentially lay somewhere else, if I interpreted what you were saying. Uh, clearly, you really couldn't go into uh, discussions with the British government or any other government for that matter with a blank sheet. Um, what kind of thinking is going on at the department about the concept which you've just raised? Well, I think there needs to be a, a lot firmer proposal as to what might be happening before it would be worth asking people to start doing work around the costings. But at a point when it appeared that the party leaders' talks earlier this year were taking forward the work. Uh, in effect, where the Haas talks <coughs> failed, uh, there were papers prepared within my department looking at some of these issues. But the reality is, we need to know the shape of any structures before we can do any meaningful work. But if you've just apportioned some of the blame at the British government, surely you've you've thought about what that apportionment might be, or that responsibility where it may lay. Or I doubt whether I would be the person who'd be the final arbiter of such decisions. You, you may not be I the arbiter, we're, but I think we're looking at for justice. I think we're looking at two governments and five parties to decide on those matters if before there's any point in the department. Well, if I can encourage <laughs> Mr. McGowan, if we can come back to the, the yeah. present budget crisis and try very, to focus well, on it's that. It's a very fundamental issue, and I'm sure yeah, no, I really appreciate that. I understand that, but um, it's taking but us into aspects that are not specific. Yeah. To the, the appreciate that, but very important issue. Thank you, Chair, for rolling me back in there. Um, uh, Minister, then, uh, on another um, Another matter, when are you likely to have a progress update on the Desert Create community uh, and policing facility? I'm not sure at this stage <coughs> when we get the next report. Yeah, um, there's a steering group meeting uh, um, so we're at the end of October uh, to take a view on that. Um, as, as you know, the, the programme board is working to get the procurement uh, uh, arrangements for the college um, back on track. Once the um, uh, steering group is consider considered, we need to go to the Justice Minister and Health Minister and then to the Executive um, for a decision. So when? Sorry. Well, I would expect I would expect uh, the, um, the, uh, the paper, uh, a paper to go to the two ministers um, in early November. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister Glenn and Nick for coming along today. Uh, can I go back to, to the prison service? Uh, Minister, in the past, in the Chamber, I've asked uh, you, I'm sure, and other members, in relation to the staff morale, especially uh, in, in McGabry. Now, my information coming from, from staff at McGabry is that staff is, uh, uh, the morale of staff is very low web. I have some information that, in relation to staffing issues, and what I'm hearing today is that these cuts will have immediate effect in the operation uh, of the prison, and that prisoners will spend longer in their cells and, and such like, which is only going to uh, make things worse uh, in animals' eyes down uh, at HMP Macabre. What have you to say about 
staffing position on the morale, and I'll ask you again today in relation to the morale of staff in that prison. Well, I have no specific information on the morale of staff other than in the unit in Glen House that I met staff a couple of weeks ago when I was last in McGabry, uh, where I saw a small team that was doing extremely good work helping prisoners with a job problem. But I accept that that is not a representative sample of prison officers. I have no specific information that I can say on that. I mean, I would not expect these cuts to improve staff morale in any part of the justice system. That's the, you know, that's the reality of what we're living with. I mean, this is not something which is the choice of Nick Perry or David Ford to do. This is something which is being imposed on us, which we are seeking to do as best we can. But I'm fully aware of the effects that it has when people see those kind of cuts occurring. Yeah, but staffing levels are below what they should be at uh, McGarry. I'm sure you'll accept that. Well, I haven't got the specific yeah. figures, so well, I'm, I'm not going to say staffing accepted. levels are not up to what they should be. Four years ago, 48 prisoners on a landing had four staff. Today, it's three to 60 prisoners, sometimes reduced to two, and on occasions, one member unlocking 40 prisoners. Now, how can that be a safe regime for prisoners and for staff? Now, those are, well, those sorry, are actual facts. Know, they, they may or may not be the facts, but all those issues are addressed through a proper risk assessment. I mean, the fact that there were, if you say it four years ago, 48 prisoners and four staff, doesn't necessarily mean that that is for all time the appropriate staffing ratio. No, but, Ratios certainly, but certainly, on, on, uh, on the other hand, one member of staff unlocking 40 prisoners is not a ratio either. It depends on the prisoners. It may well be entirely appropriate. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I wouldn't say that's what the staff would want to hear, that one to 40 is, is a good ratio. Uh, in relation to uh, say this staff morale, I'm being told they're being told to operate the re re restricted regime or to do the best you can. And that puts a lot of pressure on staff if something was to go wrong. And it's putting staff into a state of uh, sick levels are rising. I'm sure you know that. I've asked those questions before in the chamber in relation to sickness levels and such like. What I'm seeing or hearing now and what I'm seeing here today, if these cuts are implemented, that can only make that situation worse and it's going to become a very dangerous situation. Would you agree with me? Well, I highlighted the potential problems you know, to safety by these cuts. I'm fully aware of that. So we have to think of the safety of the staff and of the inmates. That this, 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 this could go, could go if, if, if the proper resource is not put in on the staffing levels into McGarvey and other prisons, what is going to happen here? What's, it, what's in your opinion is going to be the final outcome to this? Unfortunately. I don't know what the final outcome will be. I'm, you know, I'm not, not concerned. Minor. I'm concerned about every part of the justice system. I'm concerned about the cuts to police officers on the ground. I'm concerned about the cuts to the number of probation officers and youth justice officers. I'm concerned to, uh, about a range of cuts. I'm concerned about public confidence and public safety. Before we were hit with this situation, the June morning and such like, was there not a failing to put a proper recruitment process in place? That has now impacted even greater now because we are placed in a situation. Was there, would you agree or disagree if there was a proper staffing uh, recruitment process in place before this? Well, at no time was there a recommendation to me that there needed to be a, a recruitment process for prison service staff. And you're not sure if the staffing levels are correct or not at the present time? Well, sorry, I don't micromanage such issues. That's the job of the Director General of the Prison Service. Okay. Okay, I believe the prison then, uh, I know it does concern me that we, we are in that situation on what uh, effectively uh, is, a, is a, a bad situation and possibly that could get worse because of staffing levels and because of uh, resource. You touched on uh, back office, back filling of posts for the PSNI. Are these officers going back that were in back offices before, not were taken out and put onto uh, well, again, front line? Uh, I mean, the, the precise detail of that is something you'll have to ask the Chief Constable, but my understanding is 
And certainly we all heard Matt Baggett <coughs> talk about taking six or 700 officers from desks and putting mm. them into frontline response and community <coughs> policing. And my understanding is that some of those officers... And the reason he did that was to give us more out on the streets, more people, more uh, frontline policing, and to make the community safer. Now we're getting to a situation where it's going in reverse. Well, that is my understanding, but you'll have to tease that out with the Chief Constable. Well, uh, something I'll leave in the chair next week to <laughs> tease out uh, with the Chief Constable. Well, quickly, can I ask uh, uh, an issue? Uh, I think I picked you up right uh, in an answer to the Chairman. Uh, when he asked you about your own Pacific position in relation to all this. And I think the comment you made was that you would not put up with this. At what stage would you not put up with this? Uh, he did really, amongst that amongst that. all the hypothetical <laughs> questions I get asked, that really is going just a bit too far before the election. When there is, a, there is a time that you can't put up with this, I think it was a... Uh, well, where are you now with it? I've made it absolutely clear where I am now. I also made it clear in my response to the chair where the position might be. So you're not going to elaborate any further? <laughs> Why would I elaborate a point which I have made very clearly? Well, I... Uh, uh, the step, it, step it, not put up any... I will not put up with this. Uh, is, is, uh, I leave something hanging there that I will not put up with this. <laughs> If anyone makes that statement, obviously you have great concerns, I would imagine, and you would not put up with it. So <coughs> we'll leave that. I'm, I'm happy enough to leave that, Chair. Well, it, Thank you. Is that, Minister, a very real threat that you could walk if you believe public safety is compromised a statement to of such fact, an extent Chair. that it's not tenable for you to continue? It was a statement of fact. Beyond just you believing you're the most capable <coughs> MLA of the made office to do this job, set that aside. If you believe that it's not tenable to continue in post because public safety is so compromised, you would walk away. Is that a very real threat? <clears throat> it's not a threat. It's a statement of fact which I made earlier. Okay. Two quick points and then there's only two more members and, and we'll conclude this. Do you accept that these decisions are controversial? <clears throat> I suspect it's very difficult to suggest that the decisions being made by any department at the moment, with the possible exception of education, aren't controversial. <coughs> okay. That being the case, what cognizance has been given to the fact that the executive can call in decisions that are deemed controversial, and therefore, are these decisions that you believe you can take on your own, or should they be being referred to the executive for decisions to be taken? I'm the person who, at the last executive meeting, asked that the executive reconvene to look in detail at these over a period of time, a request which was refused by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. So I believe I've done what I can to ensure that the executive collectively takes the collective decisions which are required. If the executive was unwilling to do that, I would <coughs> to carry on with my staff in my department. Yeah, and I, I accept that context that you're painting about the overall picture that the executive is facing, but individual ministers can be subject to executive call-in for individual specific decisions. Should these matters specifically, cuts in probation board, cuts in the pris prison service, cuts to the police ombudsman's office, the, the police service, are they areas that you believe could be called in by three executive ministers? and the executive would have to then take those decisions. Do you want? <laughs> well, as I said in, in, in my first answer at this point, uh, I would be delighted if the executive would have a proper, coherent discussion about the priorities that face Northern Ireland in this year and in next year, would look at issues as they need to be prioritised across departments, <clears throat> and would actually take a, jo a joined up and mature approach to the difficulties we're in, Sadly, that wasn't what we got. Now, if that means that you're suggesting that some executive ministers might choose to call in any decisions I've taken, I suspect that there are 10 other departments in the same position. Mm -hmm. OK, fair point. You can take these decisions to try and live within budget, but if the executive goes into default, the head of the civil service writes to the Treasury, 
What would be the impact, and maybe this is for the, the Permanent Secretary, what implications would that have? Uh, would the decision, the authority to take decisions, move to the accounting officers, and in your case, Mr Perry, to take these decisions? My understanding is some decisions fall to the Permanent Secretary DFP. I'm not quite sure what happens after that because we are in uncharted. <coughs> <coughs> Maybe I, I think that, that is the position, Minister, that, that um, any authority to take decisions about budgetary matters rests in, in circumstances that you've described, rests with the Permanent Secretary of the DFP, uh, not with me. In terms of the in-year position as accounting officer, like every accounting officer and like my subordinate accounting officers, we have an obligation to try to live, to do everything we can to live within our budgets. Okay, so if the Treasury say executives heading into the red, they're going to default, there would be a mechanism triggered and it's the Permanent Secretary of DFP would then take decisions across all of the departments? In a sense, the, the soft option would be that the Treasury would maybe say we're taking the money off the block grant next year. Okay. If the Treasury chooses to act further, then uh, we can be, be left in the position that the DFP Permanent Secretary effectively allocates the budget to departments. Okay. Um, you've put the blame, Minister, at the executive for this current budget crisis that you have, but what is ultimately forcing you to make these cuts to your budget? What, what, is the, what do you regard as the, the primary factor in all of this? Until the June monitoring round, the Department of Justice was ring-fenced. We knew what our budget was to be. We lived within that for the first three years of this CSR period and halfway through the fourth year. We've, been, you know, we've now been in the, in the position that that factor has been changed. Part of that is clearly because of the inability of the executive to agree to implement welfare reform, which has placed you know, some additional burdens on us. But uh, primarily for the <coughs> DOJ, it's been the effect of that added to the removal of ring fencing so that well into the financial year, we found the goalposts were moved for us. But you've highlighted the reason for your ring fencing being compromised as welfare reform. Is that fair? Um, you would need to ask the Minister of Finance and Personnel who removed the ring fencing. I'm not, I'm not sure it's in, entirely that, but once the ring fencing was removed, the effects of not doing welfare reform and not doing anything about not doing welfare reform you know, have had a significant impact on us. So how do you feel then whenever you hear members, Mr McCartney, Mr McGlone, laying it on the line that you're, you're compromising potentially confidence in the police ombudsman's office, that all of the historical investigations should be uh, protected? Uh, what's your view then that 13 million taken out last year, 87 million this year, next year another 100 million to then be lectured by those representatives who are opposing welfare reform uh, that you're failing to do your job? I always thought it was the job of committee members to have a go at the minister rather than the minister to have a go at committee members, Chair. <laughs> but we are living with the consequences of the executive not having agreed welfare reform and the Department of Justice is seeking to manage a variety of different priorities, many of which impact on public safety and public confidence in a way which we can best manage, given that, as has been made fairly clear, pretty nearly every decision that I've outlined today is going beyond the unpalatable into the potentially damaging. Okay. Mr Lynch. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I ask the Minister, what will be the impact on the probation services now? They have been doing very excellent work. Can they sustain this work within these proposed courts? And when you're answering it, um, the impact on the, the uh, Justice Agency? Um, I'm not sure I'm in a position to give any specific uh, figures on, you know, any specific actions beyond the figures, the million pounds cut on probation. But I do know, as I said earlier, that a number of probation officers on temporary contracts have had those contracts terminated. I know, for example, that a number of their smaller reporting centres uh, have been closed or are in the process of being closed because one of them is next door to my constituency office. Um, and I know that some of the changes will impact on how probation officers work with them being much more tied to the office 
rather than getting out to actually see the rounded picture of those they're working with. But I think you would need, you know, you'd probably have to go to the director of probation to get more detail than that. Right. And the Youth Justice Agency? I don't at this point have any specific figures on Youth Justice Agency, but clearly, I mean, part of Youth Justice Agency is because of the custodial services that they manage at Woodlands, where there are you know, issues of ensuring the best possible staffing to do the best possible work uh, with young people facing those cuts, as well as the kind of work they do in the community, which may well have similar sorts of impacts to those of probation officers working in the community. But again, I haven't got specific details as to how that will apply at this stage. We can certainly write to you with further information on that, given that they are an agency rather than an arms length body. Okay. Mr Elliott. Chair, thank you and thanks for the presentation. Um, a quick point of, of clarification. Is there still a level of the Department of Justice budget protected? There, there is no protection for our budget beyond the 30 million. I think the Chair said earlier 27 million. I should have corrected that point. The 30 million pounds which the Treasury yeah. has given for the additional security funding for the police. And that's that, all? That is the only area which, which has any degree of protection. Okay. okay. Um, you did mention, um, and I don't like using the scales, but there's been brought in, so for, for the use of uh, convenience, or use, you, you said oh, the overall impact on a scale of 1 to 10 would have an impact of 8, whereas the impact on the police ombudsman's office mm -hmm. would be 5. It's less. I think it's whatever like 5 way, or 6. Bro. Yeah, whatever way you look at it, it's less than the impact on the overall department budget. Is that reasonable to say? Well, I believe it's reasonable, given that the budget for the police ombudsman's office had increased during this period up to now, and they have taken smaller cuts than pretty nearly any other area. I think it is reasonable to put them at a different level, allowing for the pressures they have and allowing for the increasing caseload that they have. Okay. So they're a lot better off than some of the other areas within, within your department? Um, uh, there might be quibbles about the word a lot, but I believe okay. they are better off. Okay. The, the issue of the budget, Minister, uh, we're, we're about halfway through the financial year now. Mm -hmm. um, at what stage do you start taking those significant decisions, uh, both you and the accounting officer? Has that to be done now at the, mon at the October monitoring round, or can you leave some of those to a later stage in the, in the year? I think it would be basically irresponsible to leave uh, decisions later. If, you know, every day decisions are delayed means that they have a bigger impact because it's a smaller part of the year to impose them. I mean, we are exactly halfway through the year today. Yeah. So we, we have real challenges and that's why I believe we need to, have to take action. And that's why, for example, you were seeing the Ombudsman and the Chief Constable both making statements yesterday. Yes. And is that the view right throughout the executive <coughs> that those decisions have to be taken now rather than leave them to a later stage in the year? I honestly don't know what the view of other executive ministers you know, would be on that. The, the only other minister I'm aware of uh, his detail is the Minister for Employment and Learning, for obvious reasons, where he is taking very similar actions. Yeah. And you'll have seen, for example, the University of Ulster announcement yesterday about yeah. the effects on their budget. Although, while I, while I accept your point, you said earlier that um, you wanted to discuss this in more detail at the executive. Surely there has been a level of discussion at the executive around the budget and, and how it's managed within the executive generally, hasn't it? I would find it hard to describe anything which has happened at the executive table as even a level of discussion. <coughs> okay, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds quite unusual that whenever we are in such a crisis, Minister, that there, there isn't even a level of discussion around how do you manage the process as an executive. Well, we did have a level of discussion at the last meeting about why we weren't discussing it. So each individual department is just working in a silo? I think that's a fairly reasonable summary. I suspect the, the contacts between accounting officers and the head of the civil service are probably rather better than the contacts between ministers and OFMDFM at the moment. I'll leave it at that, Chair. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other members? Uh, if the Minister has any closing comments, uh, feel free. I don't think there's anything which hasn't been well aired, or at least extensively aired. Okay, well, okay. can I thank yourselves, Glenn and Nick, for your presentation this afternoon? Thank you very much.
Okay, folks, as we move on to uh, agenda item number nine is correspondence. That there are nine pieces of correspondence. Sorry, apologies. Uh, the Chief Constable will attend next week's meeting to discuss the PSNI budgets and pressures. Following that briefing, the committee may wish to consider what action or further information is required on the financial position and pressures. So having said that, moving on to item number nine, correspondence. There's nine items of correspondence at page 156 to 117 in the meeting folder and one item at page 16 to 31 on the table pack. I will draw your attention to several of the items and then we have an opportunity to, uh, to comment on any other items of correspondence which people may have a particular interest. Item 4, pages 163 to 166 in the meeting folder, correspondence from the department providing additional information requested by the committee following the briefing by officials on September the 10th on the review of the code of practice for the appointment of independent members to the PCSPs and DPCSPs. Uh, can I advise members that the department has provided information on the number of female independent members of the PCSPs and DPCSPs and the rate of attendance at PCSP meetings by representatives by designated statutory bodies? If I can ask uh, <clears throat> people that any are items for clarification, feel free to ask. And I know that it was Alvin McGuinness and Sydney Anderson who requested this information. Uh, item 6 at page 169171, uh, an invitation from the department to the anti-trafficking event it's hosting in the Law Centre to mark a visit by the EU anti-trafficking coordinator uh, on Wednesday the 8th of October in Castle Buildings. And if any member is looking to attend, then they can contact the, the clerk. Item 1 on page 16 to 31 of the table pack is a copy of the Sejani report and to the review of the processes within the, the, the Office of the Ombuds, Police Ombudsman for the investigation and publication of reports on historical cases. This was circulated to members by email and it's on the table pack. And I ask members to note the report and ask any further information is required. I, I just assume in normal fashion, as Sajani comes up, this would be one of the reports people may wish to ask questions on. I um, ask the members to note the report and if any information is required. Anybody, any issues around items of correspondence? I'm just sure, going to say, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, just the two items, item seven and eight, uh, obviously it's from the firearms dealers, isn't that? Yeah. We're sending that on to the Minister of Justice for comment. Obviously, yes. there's an issue around uh, when matters can be dealt with the police elements in that respect. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. We've already received one cor correspondence on that already. Yeah. So, and when I read that, I, I assume that civilian, civilian staff are than I mean, I assume that's all the S and I E members are. Subject, that's what yeah, I would have yeah, thought. But yeah. I, I recall raising a question before around yeah. uh, civilian staff and, yeah. and the role of police officers yeah. and, and a question to the minister yeah. at one stage. I don't think they're subject to the no, same. I, uh, but uh, so. sometimes in the correspondence. Uh, people in these, the sort of gum federation might think of PSNA personnel involved in licensing aren't, but but they would be mm -hmm. subject to the uh, you know, okay. but the civilian members of staff aren't. That's only in certain circumstances. Okay. So so all the other actions will be uh, actions. Uh, uh, chairman's business. There is none. Uh, ask members if any other items they wish to raise. Sure. Chair, can I just? Uh, I wasn't really going to comment on, on the PSA piece uh, and percentage figures, but I'm sure if you saw looked at them, some of them actually are quite low, and it's something maybe uh, that the committee can maybe look at in the future. Is that attendance or the attendance? attendance? Okay, attendance, yeah, 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 yeah. That's attendance okay. by attendance by attendance by yeah. the, not, not the membership. No, not the membership. Oh, it's it's a public bodies. Bodies. Yeah, 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 bodies. Of course, yeah. of course. That's what it was. I'm going to say uh, there's some of them that are quite low, uh, so it may be something that the committee can keep. Uh, on the review going forward. Okay, thank you. Observe, they're not asked. We can certainly take note of some of them are last to come. Okay, and there, then there's no our business. And again, just to say uh, that absent members are best wishes, and obviously they send Sydney Anderson for the good work on this committee and what he'll do in the future. So, the date and time of the next meeting is Wednesday, the 8th of October 2014, at 2 p.m. in room 21. Parliament. One. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 21.